Hi everyone, I'm Professor Tristan Nelson, the Jackson Laura Dangerman Chair of Geography at UCSB, and I'm super excited today to talk to you about spatial data. So this is going to be a bit of an introduction to data sets that you use um, for mapping, what the characteristics of them are. I am a GIS professor, and sometimes people don't know what GIS is, so what I often say is I'm a math data scientist. So my specialty is data science that relates to to map, mappable data or data have, that have coordinates. And that is really the fundamental quality of spatial data. So sometimes we call them map data. Sometimes we say they're spatial, note the T in spatial. And sometimes we say they're geographic data. Sometimes we say they're GIS data. All these things basically mean the same thing. And it's some kind of data where it has an XY coordinate. So if you have a GPS tag essentially on your data, it means it has a longitude and a latitude, and we use that to map the data. So there are examples that you're familiar with. Um, I'm sure you probably all use Google Maps. You see navigation systems when you're driving. A really um, common data set that we thought about in a really spatial way was the COVID-19 data set. So we are going to talk a bit about COVID-19 in this module as we learn about um, spatial data. And one of the reasons that we chose this example was because of the John Hopkins dashboard, which came out very early in, um, the, in the pandemic, which allowed people to see where COVID cases were high and also look at COVID rates. This is one of the most visited websites in the world. It's had over a billion views, probably the most viewed map of all time. Um, and it also launched like a lot of interest in dashboards. So a, sort of a, an interface that links maps with all different kinds of um, tables and graphs. So I suspect many of you saw this. And if you didn't see this, then maybe you saw sort of your local example. So a lot of the counties um, public health departments or regional public health departments had their own dashboards so people could look locally at what was happening in terms of COVID cases. So I think this um, is just one really great example of how spatial data can be super powerful in the decisions that we make. But there's lots of other examples. So this one here is a map of urban heat islands. So you can see um, here things aren't points, there are these sort of continuous colors that show things like heat or air quality often gets shown this way. Here's a map of alcoholic beverage spending in the US. So a lot of um, economic data end up being associated with locations and so can also be tagged. When you use a credit card or a debit card, a lot of that information is geotagged as well. Um, here's a map from the UN of air quality. So these could be monitoring stations, the points. But you could also imagine the air quality is everywhere. So sometimes we take these point data and we model it into something that's continuous. And here's an example of the US census. So here the colors show variation in population. And not surprising, California is pretty populated. Um, we'll use the census data a lot in the U.S. in particular, but really anywhere there is a census, it becomes one of the key data sets to really understand populations and people and variation across geographies. So then the components of spatial data, whether um, it's a point, a line, or an area, are always the same. You have a location, so that means that you have a GPS coordinate. You have an x-axis and a y-axis. And if that's all you have, you have spatial data. But what is often um, used with spatial data is that there's attributes associated with it. So here you can see these are different counties. The points represent the center of the county. And then the cases would be the number of COVID cases in each, in each, at each, of, in each of those counties. So we see that you know, there's all kinds of things that we attribute spatial data with. But the cool thing is you could have this data set on COVID, you could have another data set, which would be the census data, you could have another data set on average house price in a particular city. And if you had a location, a city name or an XY coordinate, you could integrate all those data. 
And that is really like the most powerful thing, in my opinion, about spatial data. It's the fact that you can integrate so many things when all you know is location. And maybe you weren't even planning on integrating those data sets, but because you have location information, they can work seamlessly together. So let's just think of a few more. Um, one of the things I love to talk about is forestry because I did um, some of my graduate work in forestry, but often we'll map things like the location of an individual tree here. This is a red tree that is diseased and we might also collect other things about it. So it's X, Y coordinate makes it spatial, but we might be interested in its species and its height and its health. In city planning, there's a lot of great examples of, of the use of spatial data. So here we might have hospital locations and the location is interesting, but you also want to know what the hours of that hospital is, what the specialties of the hospital are, how many patients or empty beds are there. This is just an example of how we stack all these data across space. So you can see some of the data are points, some of them are lines, some of them are areas, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. But another thing I hope that you get from this slide is when we go from reality, so something that exists in the real world, to a digital representation, we're always model, we're, we're making a model, we're making a representation of truth. And there's some consistent ways in which we do that, in which we think about going from kind of a real world to a representation of the real world, which on some level always requires simplification because you just can't map. Like if you just look around you and you imagine trying to make a map of that, that was something that was that you could analyze. There's actually you know, lots of apps that 3D image your room now, that kind of thing. But if you think about that at scale, it is challenging. So you need some way of simplifying. <clears throat> Here's the general concept for how we think about going from a real world representation or from the real world to a representation of data that we can stick in a map. And the first thing to, to differentiate is whether or not you have vector data or field data. Now the term field can be kind of confusing because sometimes when we talk about databases, we store attributes in fields. This is like a field model of data, something different. It's when you think about data as being continuous. So I'm gonna start by going through the vector representations and then we'll switch over to talk about the field model representations. Basically, spatial data models are a mechanism for establishing some relationship between scientific theory and the real world. And so the first level on which we think about this is objects and fields. And in object models, space is conceptualized as self-contained objects, and we think about the relationships between them. So anything that you want to represent in the real world that you, want to, that you can easily draw a boundary around is usually considered some kind of object model. And we can draw the object. So if you're in the room, you could draw, um, draw a rectangle around your bed, and then you could attribute it with a number of things about your bed. Um, how tall it is, how big it is, if it's comfortable. So here are some examples of things we do like that. So hospital locations, here we have them represented as points. That's because we're zoomed out, so we see lots of hospitals. If you were looking really close at your data, your hospital might become the shape of a building, and in that case it would be an area. We might also use uh, lines. That's another commonly used um, type of symbology that we think about when we have objects. Lines are most commonly associated with roads. When you have lots of lines that all connect up, we call these networks. Um, there are other things like streams, which might be lines. Um, you know, those are like the most common ones I'd say that I use in my own work at least are roads and, and uh, waterways. And then we can have areas. So we think of a lot of things, uh, health service areas, we think about those as areas. School districts, we think about those as areas. Electoral boundaries, we think about as areas. So there's a number of things often that we associate with um, kind of governance of our, of our human population that tends to focus in areas. Even states or city boundaries are often represented as areas. There's other things in ecology um, that are also represented as areas like a watershed would be a great example of something that would be represented as an area. Okay, so those are all examples of things that are 
discrete units, things where you can, for some, there's some sensible reason to draw a boundary around a particular unit. There are other things that we like to map that are really hard to draw boundaries around. And we consider these things continuous phenomena or like fields, like just think like a grassy field. And the way you just can figure out if you are dealing with something that is an object or a field is imagine if you had a map of a particular phenomena, you closed your eyes and you dropped your pencil down on that map. If you could be guaranteed that when you open your eyes, there's a value at that location, that means that you're dealing with something that should be mapped as a field. So things that are typical fields are things like temperature. You can't draw a boundary very easily around temperature. This is something that is more continuous. Air quality, also very um, continuous. Elevation tends to be something we represent in a continuous way. And those phenomena are very different than, say, a house or a building, where if you had a map of building footprints, and you dropped your pen down, you might actually find your pen fell between the houses and there was no house value there. So those are objects. So I find that a very helpful way to think about these things. So, so some examples that I've already talked about are temperature, um, but precipitation, things like geochemistry, these are all things that we tend to represent in a more continuous way with a field model. Okay, so let's go back to this general diagram. So we've talked about vectors. The vectors are part of a data model. Um, so I think I called them objects earlier when I was talking, and you can think about a vector model or an object model. Those are synonyms, they mean, mean the same thing in this case. But the vectors break down into points, lines, or sometimes become networks and areas. When you have a field model, you need to be able to have a value at every single location. And so there's two common ways of doing that that I'm gonna tell you about today, the rasters and the tins. So a raster is when you divide space into small units and every single unit gets a number. So we usually call this some kind of tessellated space. And um, when you have a tessellated space, you have like a, uh, the same shape and it's just repeated over and over again. So the most common shape to use is actually a square. We see that a lot of the times, but we're seeing um, hexagons becoming more and more popular as a way of um, tessellating space because they have a lot of nice geometric properties that actually make them kind of smarter when you're dealing with things on a map in a geographic way. So like Uber has hexagons that it uses in behind its algorithms when it's doing ride share, things like that. But you can imagine then, if you had a, a map that was this tessellated space, you could put your um, pencil down anywhere and get a value. The tricky part would be is if your pencil lead was thinner than the line of the boundary, then you might have some trouble, but we're gonna imagine that our pencil is just like slightly thicker than the line of the boundary. So it's gonna fall um, on an actual value. Also, Here's a nerd alert joke. Um, when I was doing my PhD, my supervisor really liked using polygons for um, analysis. A particular kind actually that we might talk about later called Voronoi polygons. And so I realized because I love to bake that if I rolled out my cookie dough, my sugar cookie dough, and then I tessellated it, I didn't have to waste any dough and re-roll. So I used to make um, Voronoi polygon cookies and then, um, anyways, that's how I made friends during my PhD. Things have only improved slightly since then. Okay, so here's again an example of your, your lattice grid, and let's think about how you might store data in there. So this is actually an image of forest. So you can see the puffier looking patterns are big trees, and the, um, like up in the top left corner, these are very, very young trees. So if we wanted to make a map of tree age, we could do something, or, or soil moisture, sorry. We could do something like this where we drop down a hexagon and then what we would typically do is take you know, a number of samples, maybe three or four samples in each of those grid cells and then take the average of those values and store them in there. So you could have average values of soil moisture. You could also, there's um, a lot we can do with remote sensing now to extract um, information about the landscape in an automated way and store it like that. 
So that's basically what it would look like if you wanted to map something in a continuous way. Okay, the other way that we like to, um, a really common way that we represent continuous or field data is using a triangulated network or a TIN. And this is where you cover your surface in a bunch of over, non-overlapping triangles. And it's very common to see elevation models or um, yeah, models of elevation done in this way. You can also just looking at this, see how this could be good for measuring aspects. So if you have a hill slope that's facing or south east west, etc., that this could be a good way to do it. But it's super easy to calculate. So imagine that we went out into the field and we sampled elevation. So we got a bunch of points and we calculated, um, well, we didn't calculate, we used some instrumentation to well, help us calculate the elevation at each of those locations. The way we could store that is as a continuous field, because elevation is pretty continuous, is we could start to connect all those lines together. So here you can see we've joined a few lines and then we've joined a few more and now each of these three points is connected into the form of a triangle. But how do you figure out what value to store in each of your triangles? So what you do is you take the average value of all the points that the triangle is made from. So here, if we have elevations of 5, 6, and 10, and we would divide that by 3, and then we'd store in that triangle a value of 7. So that would be the elevation that that triangle would get. So unlike grids or other kinds of rasters, tins or triangulated networks are, um, they change in size. So they can be very handy if you have very unevenly sampled data. You have lots of it in some places and not very much of it in others and you want to demonstrate how much data that you had basically in a particular location. The smaller the grid or the smaller the triangle, um, the denser the data that was used to generate that. So they can be quite handy. Okay, so this has just been an introduction into some of the ways that we think about data. And as you or think about representing it, going from the real world to something that you could store in the GIS. And as you go through the modules throughout this, um, throughout this course, you're going to have all sorts of opportunity to relate what you're doing back to these modules that we talked about. So I think remember that spatial data are cool because they have location information. And it's that location information that can allow you to integrate a lot of things. And I think it's just really powerful for answering questions about where we are, where we live, what's around us. But they also often have attribute detail and there's a lot um, to be done about understanding how those attributes vary across space. So when we have this sort of, you don't have to have attribute data, but most of the time you will. And that makes it really interesting to look at geographically. If you have things that are contained, you tend to work with something called an object model. These are usually represented by points, lines, and areas. And if you have something that's continuous, think about it as a field model. Is it something that you can drop a pen on your map and have a, have a value at that location? And if so, hmm, you might want to think about rasters or tins, not vectors, rasters or tins. Um, I think, you know, in some ways, you might go about your GIS work without thinking a lot about object models and field models. But when you start to get into the analysis, there's different kinds of methods that are designed to work with different kinds of data. So some of the techniques that you might want to use for analyzing your data might only work on object models or might only work on field models. So it's just helpful to be thinking about what kind of data you have and get familiar with being able to identify it. All right, uh, thanks so much, and we're excited to move you on to the next stage of this module.